All right, we got Brother James doing adult Sunday school today. Excited to hear the word. told me, uh, hey, have adult Sunday school together. I don't care what you teach on. Like two or three days ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, all right, cool. And as we know, there's uh, many things that we talk about and we go over inside of the Bible. And uh, it's a part of a whole entire sermon or it's a part of a whole entire story. But we don't necessarily break down those smaller units that that make it up. So such as prayer. We might talk about prayer within a sermon, but we don't actually break it down as to why prayer is great and why it's good. And as we continue on in this uh, community series that we're going through, I believe today is part three of it, uh, and I hope I'm not jumping the gun on this one, because this is definitely a part of community. In fact, I would say this is a huge part of community. Not only that, but it has also been, um, it, this has been preached about heavily by the reformers and the Puritans themselves. So this is a huge topic, and they talked about it a lot. But before I get into it, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and tell you a story. So, or, or to kind of give you an analogy of things. So imagine for a second, guys and, and ladies in here, that after church, we had a special guest chef that we invited to cook for the whole church, right? He's here. Uh, and this chef is one of the best chefs in the whole world. And he doesn't just cook for everybody, and we were able to get him here to cook for everyone today. Not just that, but he has cooked your favorite meal. Your favorite meal. What, what do you like to eat, buddy? Spaghetti He made spaghetti and meatballs just for you. What do you like to eat? Taco. He made tacos. What about you, brother? Lamb. Lamb. He made lamb. Great. What about you in the back, uh, Greek woman in the back? Burgers. Burgers. Yes. He's made the... You. What about you, Pastor? Uh, lasagna and enchiladas. Lasagna and enchiladas. He, he has made the best, the best enchiladas and tacos and lamb and burgers and spaghetti tacos, all of that stuff. He's made the best of it. So he's made all your best dishes. And uh, not only did he just make them for you, he has placed your name right next to your very own plate. It's great. And church is done, and we head to the back, and he has this whole table prepared, and it's done up. The dishes look amazing. Amazing. Like, it looks good. You've never seen your dish made like this before. It's beautiful to look at. And the smells are amazing. It smells good. You're just like, mouth is watering and everything and you're ready to chow down, and you sit down, and you pick it up, whether you pick it up or use a fork, some of you, you have to use a fork, some of you just pick it up, <laughs> and you go to put it to your lips, and right before you take a bite of this great looking thing, and the aroma's there, and you're about to bite into it, all of a sudden, uh, Abby and Juliet jump up on the table, and they sit down on your tacos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or 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 to think about it, your best friend, he jump uh they he or she jumps up on the table and they stomp all over your meal. Yeah. Get their feet all in it and all of that. It's ruined. Or uh your favorite uh movie character slaps the food out of your hand. It's crazy, right? It just it just go with me for a little bit here. Uh, YouTube bans the food you're about to eat, so you don't want to eat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your boss calls and tells you, hey, man, I got some things we got to figure out. Hey, great thing to make money. So you walk away from the table and you go outside. Your food gets cold. Everyone throws away your food because they think, well, he's not going to eat. He's been out there for hours on the phone. You get this big uh, uh, Bitcoin jumps up, you know, huge. So you run out of the room and you do all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but your food's gone. You'll never be able to taste 
that food again. You'll never be able to when it's gone from you and all of that. So not you got to smell this food. You got to see this food, but you never got to chew it. You never got to digest it. And you never allowed it to get in your body to give you that nourishment that you so desired. And that whole scenario is the Christian life without meditation. That whole scenario is that. See, there's many Christians today all around the world, and I say Christian, I say that very broad, but they're all around the world. People go to hear preachings of the word of the Lord uh, on the Lord's day, Sabbath and all of that. Uh, they're serious about spiritual growth. And some might even take their Bible after church and they'll read and they'll read and they'll read. But uh, before their time in the world, the word is done, before they're done reading, the world is calling. They got things to do. Uh, they've done their five, six chapters today. They've done their two chapters, whatever it is. But the world is calling. They got things to do. Got cats to feed. They got this. They got that. They got playing to do and all of these things. And so as a result, you know, perhaps they can say something about the word. They're good. They can say a few things about the word. But they've never allowed the word to truly get inside of them, to digest, to really meditate on these things. And then on the other hand, we have some Christians who are great. Wherever you put them, no matter how times are hard, tough, prison, not prison, preaching all over the world, anger from sinners in their faces, uh, their, their bad times are really, really bad, and they continue to push forward. They're strong, they're courageous in the face of evil, they're compassionate without being pushovers. They're, they're uh, how do you say it, velvet fists and iron gloves. Everything about them is amazing, and you say, well, how do they do that? Well, we're going to get into that today. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and read Psalm 1, and this is how they're able to do those things, right? <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 1 of Psalms. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And here it is, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So what is meditation? Why is it crucial for spiritual growth? And these are the questions we're going to answer today. How do you do it? And what are practical ways to get started if you have not done it before or if it has been a long time? Now, I'm going to break down a few of those, uh, a few things that uh, the definition of meditation that's in the word. And some of, them, some of them are going to be to ponder, to imagine, to mourn, to mutter, to speak, to study, talk, utter, as opposed to muttering, utter. Growl. Oh yeah, growl. Growl is one of them. And he said, well, that's very, that's weird. That's, well, why would growl be one of them? Well, we growl all the time. Oh yeah, we, when you eat something good, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's growling. Mm -hmm. When something annoys you, what do you do? Mm -hmm. oh. You growl. Mm -hmm. When lions find their prey and they are eating it, you know what they do? They growl. Oh, watch videos of lions. They don't just growl to get people off. They growl when something's good, when they're digesting it, when they're really feeding on it, right? So we growl, yeah, and, and the Bible says you should growl. What, has something ever made you growl that isn't food, that isn't frustrating to you? What about the Word of God? Have you ever meditated on the Word of God and it's made you go, oh, oof. I grabbed yesterday when I had to deal with that home one. Yeah, exactly. Because it went against the because it went against the law of God. That thing went against the law of God. So you growled. You were frustrated. Mm -hmm. well, how long? It, Jesus growled. I'm sure he didn't just say, "How long must I suffer with you guys?" I'm sure he was like, "How? How long must I suffer with you guys?" He growled. Amen. Oh yeah, the Lion of Judah. You don't think he wasn't growling? Anyway, so meditation. Um, so meditation, and here's a few things. We're going to go through these. I'm going to try to make this short. Usually these take a long time, but uh, this can be a whole, this could be a whole two-part series. And the reason why I say that is because, like I said, this is what the early Puritans and the Reformers talked about. 
they said meditation was just as important to your physical, uh, to your spiritual growth as prayer and Bible reading. They said this is important. Mm -hmm. This is between your prayer and your Bible reading. This is between it, and this is this covers all the other areas that are left um, that are left blank inside of your life. Prayer. Uh, prayer, Bible study, living holy, out preaching. Well, what do I fill the rest in with? How about meditating on the things you've been out there preaching? How about meditating on the things that came out of the pulpit? What about meditating upon the things that, that go against the law of God in this world that you see today? That colors in the rest of it. So meditation colors in the rest of your Christian life. Amen. That's what it does. So let's turn to... Uh, so meditation heals a believer's heart and settles his mind. That's, that's, that's principle number one. Let's go ahead and turn there to Proverbs chapter 31. Are we going back to Psalms 1 or no? Uh, no, okay. no. I was going to, but to keep it shorter, we're going to move forward. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, yes. Proverbs 31, uh, we're going to look at uh, verse 4. Now, I know all the women inside this church, you guys probably know Proverbs 31 very well. And this is not just a mother who has pleaded to her son about uh, these things she's about to say. This is from a prophecy that was told, passed down, and these are things that come from the Lord. If it's a prophecy, that, that means a person spoke <laughs> was the mouth of the Lord in this instance. So these, you know, we say the, uh, the uh, Proverbs are principles to live by, you know, not, they're, you know, things to go by. It's not 100% like, hey, if you do this thing, then that's it. But this one is a prophecy. So this straight up is a real thing that if you don't do these things, this is what's going to happen to you. And we're going to look at verse 4. Uh, how, how did we go around last time? Pastor, how did you do this last time? Was it here and then you went back or it was in the back? And... I usually start in the back. Okay. Uh, my wife, I'll have you read uh, verse 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes to strong drink. So already we know the scripture that we had last, uh, last month. Talked about a royal priesthood, royalty. Uh, you guys are royalty if you're truly saved. And the first thing it says, it's giving a warning to these people. It's not for kings, nor for princes. So these are two things. Talking to the young men, uh, the men and the young men. Of course, uh, women, this is good for you as well. And you shouldn't be, you know, wine and strong drink. But we get into it, and that's the reason why. Uh, go ahead and read verse, so here. Uh, go ahead and read verse 5. Uh, and six more. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Oh yeah, give it to them. These are the ones that are perishing. These are the ones with heavy hearts. This is what the world says. The world says, oh man, you had a tough day at work. Hey, go, uh, let's go out and get a drink. You had a tough day at work. Oh, things are really hard for me. I need, I need drugs. I need this medication. I need uh, to run from my problems. Pornography. All of these things. We can go on and on. There's a whole list. Even food can be a medication for people. The Bible talks about in Ecclesiastes that the princes, you know, will eat in due season for uh, strength and not for drunkenness, which means people go out there and they'll eat themselves to death to forget all their problems. Oh, yeah. They'll do it. So whatever. So they're trying to medicate everything about themselves with the world. It has nothing to do with God. And right here it says these things uh, will cause you to forget the law and pervert the judgment. And this is talking about to the kings and the young men. Of course, in the context of this, it's talking about this king. Uh, hey, you don't want to pervert judgment. You're the king. you got all these things going on. But I'll say that goes to actually Christians themselves. You don't want to pervert God's judgment. Uh, the, we just read it in the first scripture, uh, talks about meditating on God's law day and night. Because if you have God's law in your head, eventually you're going to speak it out, and we'll get to that later. But there's a process to it. The things you meditate on, the things you delight in, are what you're going to meditate upon. I'll just say it like that. The things you delight in are what you're going to meditate upon. You guys heard the story earlier when I talked about, oh, Juliet and Abby jumped up on the table. 
and meditate on those things might keep you away from it. Not getting on Julia and Abby or you girls. But I'm saying, if you're just so focused on all of those things in your life, it's going to take out all judgment and law inside of your head. It's your, Now your head's filled with other things. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I should have had you read uh, verse 7. Go ahead and read verse 7 as well, Mom. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Remember, and that's what the world tells you. Hey, if you do this, your problems are solved. You'll forget it. What they say, it's, it's like pu putting Band-Aids over bullet holes. Yeah, it might make you forget for a second, but your problems are always there. And now that you've put them off for so long, it's gotten worse. Yeah, so, uh, so we want to always meditate on the things of God and not so much on the things that are out there. So as I said earlier that meditation settles the mind, let's go look at a young man who really needed his mind settled uh, in the New Testament. Uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. By the way, I know we're turning there and I ask a question, but what are some things that can keep you guys from really thinking and meditating on God? I know I gave a few examples. Um, oh, we can medicate it with alcohol or do this or do that. Oh, what do you think, Caden? What are other things that can keep us from thinking about God in our everyday life? It doesn't matter. Whatever you think. It, everything you say is not wrong. Or, I mean, unless you say, <laughs> the only thing that keeps me from God is going out there and doing really hard sin. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Little things that you don't think about in your life. Mm -hmm. You don't know? What about reading uh, bad books all the time? Books. Mm -hmm. More than you read the Bible. Or all those. That could be one. Yeah. Yeah, that could be one. Mm -hmm. the, cares, the cares of the world. The cares of the world. The fear of the future. Yeah, fear of the future. Yeah, there's some people that don't even leave their house because they're like, hey, any second the bombs could go off right now or, or we'll be raptured and that's it. So I'm just going to stay stuck in my uh, little bubble here mm -hmm. or that. I was going to say worries of the future, but also the other dynamic of that is some people dwell on the mistakes of the past. Exactly. Some people make that a whole entire idol to themselves, too. They make their misery their idol. Um, being careful and troubled about many things. Many things, absolutely. Many, many things. All the things that don't even matter at all. You know, and even Jesus said it. They're like worried about him washing his hands. And Jesus is like, do you know who's in your house right now and you're worried about washing hands? What about you, little one? What do you think? You? Yes, you. My daughter, yes, you. Um, playing? Playing. Yeah, always worried about when am I going to get to go play, when am I going to get to go outside, all oh, this and that and this, and not any thought about the Lord. Yeah, that's very good. So uh, we're going to read right here in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, now, there's many things that are going on. Timothy, obviously, is the, is the pastor, is a, the young. Uh, he's going to be a mouthpiece for Paul. He's going into this church. Paul's already giving him things that he wants him to focus on and do. And, uh, you know, we can read through this, but to keep it shorter, he's already talked about, uh, hey, there's going to be guys over there speaking lies and hypocrisy, people giving heed unto false fables and all these things, put them back in a remembrance, and then we'll get down to verse 10 of chapter 4. Pastor, can I have you read verse 10 to uh, 12? For there... For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Yeah. So he's giving... Eh, eh. I know your thoughts right now, Timothy. Maybe you're a little unsettled. You think that people won't listen to you because you're so young. But I want to let you know if you just focus on these things, and he gave a list, and a part of that list that he talked about, uh, in word, in conversation. But those are two different things, in word and conversation. And the word of God produces your conversations. The dwelling on the word of God produces the more reading in God's word, 
which produces the conversations. And that really strengthens you. And then it's the rest of the things in charity and, charity and spirit and all of those things. Um, go ahead and read verse 13 to 14. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. And uh, Brother Levi, read verse 15 and 16. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Yes, yeah, so... Right here, as you see, he, he's given them a whole list. And, and then the last thing he says in 15, he says, meditate upon these things. Not only all the things I've told you, but the fact that you've had hands laid on you. Sometimes you need to, guys, you need to meditate on your testimony, where you've come from. You need to meditate on it. Not all the bad parts of your testimony. Some people can talk about all day, all day what they've done in the world. Can give you... Where they were, what they were wearing, their tennis shoes. But as soon as you say, well, when did you get saved? Oh, man, I don't know. I don't know, but I just, oof. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, you should meditate on your testimonies. You should meditate even on your praise reports. Anybody got a praise report in here that they think like, yeah, God did that for me? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Mom, you got a praise report? Oh, yeah, you can go ahead and say it. Well, I know that uh, God had told me many times. Many times. Many. Yeah. So when things are getting tough and you think I'm sick right now, do you say, I remember that one time I was sick. Oh, I might not recover. Or do you think about, yeah, no, God healed me that one time from that. I know he'll do it now. Amen. Right? Amen. Anybody else? Praise report? Wife. Many things. Many things, like our baby right now in your hands? Yeah. yeah. Baby, or like God healed me, but what was more crazy than all was healing my daughter from an autoimmune disease. That yeah. was like. Those are praise <laughs> reports that we should meditate upon. And that was one that Timothy had here. And he says, hey, remember the, uh, remember, uh, which was, you know, neglect not the gift that was given thee. You have a gift. Don't forget that. Hands were laid upon you. They prophesied over you. Those were good things. Med hey, remember those things. Too busy we get caught up in meditating on everything that's wrong and you forget to meditate on the things that are right. Uh, David said, I encourage myself in the Lord. He was meditating on all the times God got him out of a bad situation when everything seemed so bad. So it's good to meditate on things that are good. So... Meditation is a necessity for ever-growing health to a believer. It is. It's good for your health. And you know, people can make themselves sick just by thinking about how sick they once were. Or they can see they're hypochondriacs. I know that's a Greek word. Don't say it. Uh, you can turn on the TV right now and someone there might be some health scare and someone really freak themselves out into becoming sick. My grandmother used to do this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All the time. You make up something, you say, oh, I got that, I made it up, ha. Huh? No, but it really feels, no, I can't be wrong. Right. So, and here's a famous quote. It says, uh, without meditation, all is lost. And this is about the Bible. Meditation imprints and fastens a truth in the mind. As a hammer drives a nail to the head, so meditation drives a truth to heart. Without meditation, the word preached may increase notion, but not affection. Without truly dwelling on those things. Sure, a person can read in the Bible all day, then go out there and they're preaching a stale. Because they never chewed on it, digested it, to make it known. To make it known what they're saying. People say, oh, there's some truth behind that. That person knows what they're saying. Or is it just stale? Is it just bland? I'm just telling you, hey, yeah, Psalms 5.5. Five, five, that's it. Or there's only two colors, Yeah. <laughs> just repeating things that they've heard. 
So, uh, the Puritans believed in meditation, and they set forth uh, Joshua, Moses' successor, to demonstrate the necessity of meditation. We're going to turn there right now. Joshua chapter 1. Yes, to meditate upon it. This is where I probably get one third of all revelation that I get. It's from meditating on it. Yeah. Well, there's this thing, like, people sometimes can't be alone with themselves. So they want to listen to music. They want to watch TV. They want to do these things. They want to keep themselves busy so they don't have to think. Every reprobate possibly can't think upon anything. God's given them over to that reprobate mind, therefore they don't want to think. They don't want to know the judgment that's coming to them, so they fill their minds with everything else. Oh yeah, that's why the Bible says they're filled with all unrighteousness, because the more unrighteousness you try to... Uh, it's like taking gasoline and trying to put out a fire. That's what it is. Amen. Right? That's Amen. what unrighteousness is. Amen. I'm taking pills to get over my anti-depression, and now I'm suicidal because of the pills, and now that I'm suicidal, I want to smoke weed because I want to relax, and I smoke weed now, now I'm paranoid, and now I need this pill. On and on and on and on. Yeah. Joshua chapter 1. Uh, oh, before, I, before I go into this, uh, does anyone know the great miracle that Joshua was involved in? Kids? Uh, I know the adults know it. Kids, what miracle was Joshua involved in that everyone knows Joshua for? You're not a kid, so I don't know. Yes? Um, the towers. The, the towers? Things? Yeah, yeah, the walls. Yeah, the, the walls, walls of what? Jericho. You, you got Jericho. Jericho. That's right, the walls of Jericho. This is what he's known for. So, that's what we're going to talk about. But before we get there, so I just want to let you know to give context to the story. The Lord, before this whole, the walls of Jericho falling down, it had to, something had to happen first. And the Lord encouraged Joshua for the task of conquering the promised land. And they did not discuss military strategies. I want to let you know, when God met up with, uh, with Joshua the first time, and this was after Moses laid his hands on him, and the Spirit gave him the Spirit of Wisdom. The spirit of Wisdom comes upon Joshua. Then the Lord speaks to Joshua, and he encourages him. And they did not discuss, discuss military strategies or battle plans at this rare meeting. They did it. So I want to show you what was talked about before that. Before this. Because he already knows that God's going to give them these lands. He already knows God's going to allow him to conquer and take this and take that. And before it gets there, God didn't say, go sharpen your, your swords, go make sure everyone's trained up. This is the thing that he talks about. Let's go to verse 6. Um, Alina, go ahead and read verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shall God divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto your fathers to give them. Yeah, but the, these lands were inhabited, so this is interesting. This is what we're going to get to. God's already telling him he's going to give it to him. Uh, Ariathne, go ahead and read verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thy go. And uh, Keziah, read verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So it's always going to be hard to walk and do the will of God if you aren't meditating on the word of God. Uh, you won't have power over sin unless you're meditating on the law of God. You can't speak the law unless you're first meditating upon it. And you won't do the law unless you've first spoken about it. So that's the way it works. You're going to meditate on it. And after you're meditating, then you're going to start speaking it. Then now that you're speaking and you're saying it out loud, you're going to do it. Amen. Amen. Those are those three things. Did God... That's the foundation. Yeah, that's the foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, did David not say, by your own words you condemn yourself? 
But by my own words, when I'm speaking the law, those are the things I want. So then if you don't do it later, someone's going to say, well, hold on, man. Didn't you just say that you, you, you wanted God's law? And now you don't? Now you're just, wait, you mean you don't want to stone the homo now that we got him and caught him? But weren't you speaking the law all those times? Or were you just, the pastor was saying it, so you just said it. Right? So the Lord told Joshua that his greatest need was to live by meditating upon God's word. Out of all of that, that's what God told him. Meditate. You shall meditate on the word day and night. When were they doing sacrifices? Uh, day and night. And the Lord said that was all day. All day. So when we say to meditate all day, that's what it is. Day and night. Day and night. So, and here's another, here's another principle we'll talk about. The idle mind is the devil's playground. We've heard that so many times, but this is true. The idle mind is the devil's playground. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Yeah, and what do they say with this stupid meditation in the world now? Clear your mind. Clear it. Empty it. Empty it. And then you have the other people that, that sweep it, and the world sweeps it by other ways. Oh, go and talk about it to a psychiatrist. Just sweep it. Sweep it. By the way, sweeping is different from vacuuming. I just want to throw it out there. I know there weren't vacuums back then, but I want to make that very clear. <laughs> vacuuming sucks up even the dirt. The stuff that's on the ground that you can't get to, that sweeping doesn't get to. It sucks and it pulls. Your mind needs to be a vacuum to get out all the bad things. Don't just sweep it, causing dust to get in the air and all of that. And even when you walk through it, you have to cover your mouth because there's so much dust in the air. That's how people's minds are today. They get out one small sin, one thing that they're thinking about, and they'll meditate on something else. That's all the dust that's in the air. And then here's another word we see there, garnish. And garnish... When you garnish something, those are things to make the place look nice. So what have you been reading? Well, I've been reading this. All reading. No meditating upon what it means. I've heard people that said one scripture, just one scripture, giving me one scripture. I've heard babes read one scripture, very new in the Lord, and it's hit, whoa, because they believed what they were saying. They meditated upon that. It got them. And I've heard people that say, well, I, I know 10 books of the whole Bible memorized. I know this king. I know that, 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 that. And it's just dull, dry, one ear, not the other. Uh, yeah, you see uh, people out there preaching. So I give you 100 scriptures and everyone's just walking by, walking along. You have a little kid. We say, okay, let's, uh, let's give uh, the kids a chance to read a scripture on the mic. And what happens? All these demons start coming, yelling and all of that. Because they believe those scriptures. One. Amen what it is meditate on it also um besides emptying the mind the religious world says do prayers of repetition yes yeah. yes absolutely i uh purpose why are you praying why are you doing that like i said when uh when i had my son here he would go out he would do the chickens he would do this he had his chores he would do it every morning and then one day one day he got up and he said dad i gotta ask you if I don't go and if I don't go and bring the eggs in and do all the chicken stuff and all that, no one gets eggs, huh? I said, no, buddy, they don't. And then boom, he had a purpose. He had a mission. I no longer had to tell him, get up and do it. He had a mission. He was focused. He knew he wanted to get it done. And that's how Christians should be. What's your mission? What's your focus? Uh, you can't have a mission if there's no focus on things. 
If you're not meditating on God's law, then you don't have a mission. You don't. And garnishment as well, when you throw it on a plate, you don't eat it. It just looks good. It's just there. It's just there to make everything else look good. So garnishment, you cannot chew. You can't chew on. You can't devour it. It doesn't bring you nutrients. Uh, turn to, and here's a good way to uh, get rid of that. Turn to Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, there's so many places we go on and on about meditation on here and thinking about the things of God, but we're going to turn to 119 verse 92. I had Havoc read last, so I will read 92. <laughs> Questions, comments so far? Verse 92, unless, oh, I still hit pages. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. 93, I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. 94, I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. So three things you're going to see in here, delight, Forget and salt. I said earlier, when you delight in something, you're going to meditate on it. It's on your mind all the time. You girls love Abby and Juliet. I hear it all the time. They ask me this question all the time. Jack, do you love Abby and Juliet? And it, and it takes me away from the thought process that I had in that moment because I don't think about them like that. And that's fine. Everyone has different delights or things they're thinking upon. But it takes me away from that. So whatever you think about, you're delighting in because you talk about it. It's joyful to you. <laughs> what have you read in the Bible? Oh, man, I read. And they'll give you a whole thing they've been thinking about. Or when you say, well, what do you read? Ooh, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I didn't read today. Well, why not? Oh, well, I got busy. Maybe because you don't delight in those things. Are you preaching the same the thing uh, now as you did six months ago on the streets? Yeah. Has your message uh, gotten deeper or more sharp or whatnot? Is it the same scripture you're quoting every single outreach? Can I hear another one? <laughs> or you just got that one? Yeah. What you delight in is what you're going to... Uh, you don't have to memorize when you delight in those things because it touched you. Mm -hmm. it, it hit you. You're like, I don't even have to I, 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 say the whole thing because you get it. When you understand something, it, it, the memorization happens. It comes. So my suggestion, you guys, and here's a tip. And anytime you want to memorize a scripture, go ahead and apply it to yourself, what it means to you. Write in your own words what it means. What does this mean to me? How does it, what does it mean to everyone else? The memorization will come once you understand it for yourself. So they delight in these things. And David says, I'm not going to forget because when you delight in something, you don't forget it. Just like I asked the, told the girls, you love Abby, you love Juliet. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we love them. Forget them. Forget them. Wipe them out of your mind. Don't even think about them again. I know uh, I have kids. I love my kids. I'm not going to forget them. You don't forget the things you love. Yeah. It's that simple. And, and here's the thing. You know what happens? Not only do you not forget, but you're going to seek more about those things. You want more. Wow, the Bible says this here. Oh, what else does the Bible say? What else? The scripture in uh, Proverbs, I think it's 25, it says, uh, the glory of God is to conceal a matter, and the heart of kings is to search it out. Search it out. That's the heart of kings. If you're kings, what we just talked about, you're going to search out these things. But the first thing is, it's the glory to God to conceal it. God's like, hey, because I love you so much, I'm going to hide it because I want you to think about it. I want you to think of things of how amazing God is. The fact that we take silicone and we break it down into this tiny thing and it powers up a cell phone. Who thought of that? Well, God did and he concealed it. <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. You look these things out. You flesh it out. How, how did historicism get brought to this church? Pastor was thinking, oh, wait a minute. That's not, let me think about this. That doesn't. 
That, that's how it happens. Right? Yeah. Meditating on mind. Uh, so, as I said, what you delight in, you will meditate upon. You won't easily forget it. You will seek it out more. That's what you have to remember. Now, I said the Puritans and the uh, Reformers, they believed in the power of meditation so much. Here are four principles of the necessity of meditation. And this uh, comes directly from one of my favorite uh, Puritans, Thomas Watson. Uh, here's four, four principles that he talks about. Uh, one, the end why God has given us his word, written and preached, is not only to know it, but that we should meditate on it. The scripture is a love letter. We must not run over it in haste, but meditate upon it. Uh, number two, the necessity of meditation appears because without it, we can never be godly Christians. A Christian without meditation is like a soldier without weapons or a workman without tools. Number three, without meditation, the truths we know will never affect our hearts. I like that one. That's very true. Verse four, without meditation, we make ourselves guilty of slighting God and his word. Could you imagine if, uh, and, and I know you guys are, everyone, there's many of us who are married in here. <laughs> but if, if you, mom, if you texted my dad right now and said, I love you, and he ignored it for three days, a week goes by, seven, you know, ten days go by, a month goes by, not even thinking about it. Not, hey, did you, did you, yeah, yeah, you said I love you. See what I mean? That's the word of God. How quickly do you just read over these things and just, oh yeah, yeah, God says that. And this is a love letter to us, guys. Don't forget that. The, God's very loving when he burnt down Sodom and Gomorrah. It's very loving. You meditate on those things. You meditate on that when God flooded the whole earth. But we forget the love part. There was a whole nuclear family that he kept alive. Nuclear family, dad, mom, children. Yeah, very Nuclear loving. family. Very loving. Very loving. This is all a love letter. And we're wrapping this up. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. So in saying that, so here Paul uh, connects right thinking and right practice with meditation. Um, so funny we're just... Uh, yeah, you didn't you know that was not No, I did not know, so it's funny. <laughs> I was hoping you weren't going towards that, but I, I'm pretty sure we had that as a memory verse before, right? Uh, which one are you about? Chapter that? 8. Uh, chapter 4, verse 8. Uh, no, I, I don't believe Verse it. 8 and 9. I don't remember having that as a memory, but it's one we could memorize later. It's a great one. I like this one. So, before I, I say this, does anybody know what the world associates with meditation today? Anyone? You know what? Yoga. <laughs> Yoga. Yeah. yeah. Hinduism. Yeah. Empty your mind. Mm -hmm. You see, all, and what, what makes me mad is there's all these things everywhere. Oh, this billionaire gives you his morning routine. You know what every single one of those routines have? I do 10 minutes of meditation. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Every actor is saying, oh, I meditate. Oh, I meditate. Medi well, what does that mean? What is meditation? That's why you see some of these famous people killing themselves and all that, because they're emptying their minds so much. <laughs> but what's worse is they're telling everyone else to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right? And this is what meditation truly is right here. We're going to read it. Uh, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. See, Paul just associated all of that with peace. You want peace? 
Meditate on all these things. Meditate on these things. Oh, I'm confused with my walk in the Lord. I'm, I'm anxious. I don't get any sleep at night. There's another scripture where David says on his bed in the nighttime, he's meditating on God's precepts and they keep them up because they're so good and it's so awesome. And the good way. There's some people that can't fall asleep right now because their heads are filled with so much garbage. Can't think on anything pure. You know who can't think on anything pure? Reprobates. The word came and the word became what? Flesh. flesh. And what did Jesus say about his flesh? My flesh. Eat my flesh. Yeah. Are you chewing on his word? They talk about the unclean animals and how things are set apart to show God's clean and unclean. And this is, you know, can be applied to Christians today. Do you guys know that the animal that does not chew on the cud is considered unclean? Are you chewing upon God's word? And if you're not, it, it's good to. I'm sorry, actually, I have a few. Here's a few uh, quick ways I said people who haven't done it before. Here's a few practical things and then we're done. Um, here are some practical ways to meditate on God's word. Take one scripture. And this is for you guys, just starting out. Think about it all week. And these are the questions to ask yourself. How does this apply to me? How does this apply to people around me? And how can I implement it now if I'm not already doing so? If you're not already doing it, how can I implement it? Here's another way. Uh, there's a lot of people that say, well, I listen to a bunch of sermons. Good. You should. But then there's sometimes to cut off the sermons after you've listened to them and sit in the Word. Sit in it. So when you go, oh, I listen to that one, what else am I going to listen to? What else? Why can't you be alone for a second and think about those things? You're never going to come up with what you believe if you're always thinking about what someone else is saying. So sit in it. Uh, three, think about theonomy. Think about a, wor a world in which God's law is already applied. Think about it. How's that going to look? What's it look like to you? What's it look like to your neighbors? What's it look like to your kids in the future? Right? These are things to think about. Uh, four, think about brothers and sisters around the world. Guys, we're not the only Christians. There's others who are suffering right now. Or even in their suffering, they're happy. <laughs> think about that. Why are they happy and they have less than what I have? Right? Mm -hmm. Uh, even Paul said, remember uh, those in bonds as though bound with them. Think about how would it be if you were bound with them? What would you say to them? How would you be happy during those times if you're bound with them? What can make you happy? Uh, five, open your eyes when you are out and see the things that God's law would change if it's flowing today. That's my favorite one. Yeah, oh yeah. You go through the stores, you look at things, you say, oh man, that's not right. They have naked people on here. Well, what would God's law be if they were doing that today? It would be three death penalties, the yeah. court, the photographer, and the owner of the company. Absolutely. <laughs> and I would say uh, also those who, who purchased from that as well. Yeah. Uh, in the sense of, if you know, uh, like, if they let's, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. let's say the, the people that have the porn. Yeah. Okay, whatever. We got the photographer, we got that. But why is this trash even being able to be filmed? They have camera equipment. They have that where they get the funds. Yeah, who owns yeah. the building that they rented? There's a whole, and, and that, and you see how you can dwell and think about that for a long time. So it's, it's a good thing. So yeah, and those are just a few. Anyone else have anything else to add to that list? Those are just a few things I wrote down. Anybody else know any other ways you can put this back on you? Kids? What about after your uh, Bible reading in the morning when you guys read your one scripture or whatever? What do, you, what do you could do after you read that one scripture? What do you think? I'm pointing at a left <laughs> yeah, and just always ask yourself those same three questions, kids. You know, how does this apply to me? How mm -hmm. does this apply to others? And 
how can I implement what I learn? What do you boys do before you read and after you read? We pray. Yeah, and I'll say even the the um, the prayer is uh, uh, well. Right after reading the Bible, if you're going into that prayer, you could take a few seconds, take a step back, and be like, I wonder what things I have not prayed about lately. Have not. People have the same prayer every time and they get stuck in it and they forget that maybe you've forgotten about 20 other things you should pray about unless you don't think God cares about those things. <laughs> right? But yeah, that's, do you have a question or a comment? I, I was going to say, um, even like, you know, sometimes it's like going back to whenever you're first, uh, well, born again. Not, mm -hmm. You know, I'm talking about like myself, I was born again and not saved. But I would... When I would read a scripture that morning, I'd read my Bible and I see a scripture and I'm like, oh, that's really good. And I would always like look for an opportunity to use that specific scripture to give to someone else or to like, you know. Absolutely. Kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah. You know, not necessarily for someone else, but like, you know, how can I, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, speak it out to someone else or use it in the context someone's come for you to with advice and say, you know what? I just read this morning this and this and this. Which goes to what I just said. You meditate on it, then you're going to think about it. I mean, you're going to meditate on it, then you're going to speak it, then later you're going to do it. What does it matter if you're a woman, if you read, oh yeah, women shouldn't be loud inside the church. And you're like, man, I really thought about that shit. So da, 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 all through church, right? Just, just random. But anyways, yeah, amen. Thank you, Brother James. And uh, I don't really have anything to add to that besides uh, we, we, when we pray, we do three things. We, we pray, we do prayers of supplication, which is when we're praying for others, for family members, for the persecuted church, and we meditate. And so meditation is a, is a form of prayer, maybe a little different form of prayer, a little active. And, and uh, you know, it's what Samuel said when he was a young man. He said, speak, Lord. Thy servant listens, you know. And so the scripture will bubble up in the spirit of your heart and a different part of that. And we're meditating upon the scripture primarily is what we're meditating upon, not upon other things, but secondary, uh, what James gave. You know, how can theonomy be applied and say, how can I share the scripture? Uh, how can this affect my heart? How can I make a practical change to make this happen? To flow in your word better and all those other lists. It was a great list. Very good list. Amen. Let us pray.